What's up, what's up, what's up? Back at it once again, a Koski of Fun Day. Kicking it for you and for yours, homeboy. And homegirls, you know what I'm saying? People out there that's enjoying loving African history. And that's all we spit and that's all we do. Uh, what else, you know what I'm saying? I gotta shout out to my ancestors as usual, you know, because they gave me the power, the definition, and all that stuff, you know. Like for me, they just give me this stuff and just, I just run with it, you know what I'm saying? It'd be like an overload sometimes. But I love it and I enjoy it and I just push it on to the people. And also shout out to y'all, you know what I'm saying? With the lookership, the watching shit, you know, doing things like that. You know, much love to y'all. Now this one right here is the Lukaska Manifesto Strategy of the OAU States and its consequences for freedom struggle in Southern Africa. Now we talked about this in the last, but this is part two. We're gonna look at Angola. And we talked about the word consequences. Consequences can be positive or negative. So you hear consequence don't mean it gotta be a bad thing. You know what I'm saying? It could be a positive consequence. It could be a negative consequence. But we're gonna look at this and we're gonna look at it how it worked out in Angola. You know what I'm saying? So like I said, we're gonna get into this, this African history is not really talked about. All right, the Angola scuttle. However, was the Angola Civil War that provided the litmus test to the OAU strategy? Like in Rhodesia, three living British movements were persuaded by the frontline states to sign a declaration of unity only days before they met the Portuguese government for the purpose of negotiating independence agreement. However, unlike Smith and Rhodesia, the Portuguese had had enough of guerrilla war or anxious to share their government responsibility to the movements. An interim government was formed and with a unusual large cabinet, which never functioned. Fighting between the movements broke out before the date of independence, November 11, 1975. In October, South African troops invaded Angola from the south and seized the Caribbean dams and thrust the forward to the humble towards the one that supported United forces. Well-trained FLNAN forces poured from the north using tanks and armored cars provided by the government of Zaire. It soon became clear that the MPLA would have a difficult task to withstand attacks from two fronts. However, under this intense pressure, Augusta Nito, president of the MPLA, went ahead in the process of transferring former power from Portugal. He announced the independence of Angola and established the Angola People's Republic on November 11. He quickly appealed to his friendly socialist countries for military assistance. On November 27, a Cuban artillery regiment arrived in Luanda after encountering proclamations of all kinds from American warship and planes in the Atlantic Ocean. With Cuban personnel and Russian weaponry, MPLA was able to drive off the besieged forces from the north and the south. By February 1976, all foreign troops had left Angola soil and MPLA was establishing order and administration throughout the country. A special OAU meeting called in November to discuss the raging Angola civil war failed. I'm gonna say again, a special meeting, OAU meeting called in November to discuss the raging Angola civil war failed to muster support from half the members in order to recognize the MPLA government. The vote was a dead heat with 22 states supporting MPLA recognition and 22 against. Even a state like Zambia, which has supported the MPLA reparation war for 10 years, voted against this recognition. Mm. The reason for the reluctance of so many OAU members to recognize the MPLA government are not far to seek. Firstly, the success of the MPLA seriously undermined the policy of Adante launched in 1974 by the South African government with support of Britain and the US. This policy aimed at harmonized relationships between South Africa and Black African states in order to achieve the following goals for South African foreign policy. A, to establish a Southern African common market, which would be dominated by South African manufacturing companies. B, to secure Black, South Af Black African markets outside the projected common market for the bulging products of South African manufactured goods. C, to secure a ring of buffer states that would not harbor or support South African bomb gorillas 
and D, to secure South Africa and the West, the products of the mineral rich area of Zambia, Angola, and Zambia, Zaire. The policy of Andante in the context of the Southern Africa was built on recognition that the basic interests of the national bourgeoisie of South Africa and those of the ruling petite bourgeoisie and independent Black African states were similar, if not identical. Hendrik Bergward, the theologian of the Africanas, created a facade of Bantus in 1960s to remove the psychological and racial barrier of cooperation between South Africa and Black Africa. But Southern African industries, industrialists, and manufacturers were pressing for this realization before the independence of Black Africa. It is no surprise that Harry Oppenheimer, chairman of the Anglo-American Corporation, and Tinny Rowland, manager of L-O-N-A-N-R-H-O, were the prime movers behind the policy of Dante in the Rhodesian Constitutional Conference discussed above. Their primary claim that the middle rich area, Zambia, Angola, Zaire, and, and Namibia, in which South African industry had a big state, should be associated with the bigger interests in South Africa. Obviously, if Yanita, uh, FALA, had seized power in Angola, Chief Caputo would have been installed in power in a glorified Bustanistan in Namibia, and access would have been established to the entire area. This fact partly explains the quick development of the South African troops in Angola and the refusal of Zaire and Zambia to support the MPLA movement at the OUA meeting. And for many months after he had won a victory, the loss of Angola to MPLA introduced a revolutionary element, element to the Adante exercise. Secondly, most of the OAU members who did not support MPLA were scared of a seizure by power by a movement within a revolutionary program. MPLA had long declared itself a Marxist Leninist party and would consider the structure of the capitalist system as its prime duty. Both South African government and its Western European and North American supporters, as well as the conservative ruling class in most African states, are agreed that the real revolution in any African country would not serve their purposes. So let's read this one more time. MPLR, MPLA had long declared itself a Marxist Leninist party and would get a center destruction of the capitalist system as their prime duty. Both the South African government, its Western European and North American supporters, as well as the conservative ruling class in most African states, are agreed that a real revolution in any African country would not serve their purposes. It would have the wrong kind of demonstration effect. This is, in fact, the refusal of the most members of the OAU to harbor the realists of a buyer training facilities. In fact, one of the main supreme tests of the degree of Napoleonism in an African society today is its willingness to train and equip guerrilla forces against colonialism and imperialism. On this criteria, the OAU divide themselves neatly into three categories. A majority which do not have want to have anything to do with guerrillas or freedom fighters. B, a few provide transit facilities only and possible money. And B, the very few, especially Tanzania, Mozambique, Angola, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Algeria, and the Congo, which have camps and training facilities. On this point, most African states find the common cause with South Africa and Western Europe in opposing communism. The fear of communism is the fear of radicalism. Henry Kissinger's intervention in the Rhodesian case was justified on these two points. The de-radicalization of the movement and B, the fear of an Angolan type introduction of Western weaponry in Cuban forces. On these two points, he had loved the support of most African states, including some with very few mentioned as providing camps and training facilities. His successes of Fremo in Mozambique and the MPLA in Angola were repeated in Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa that were set in a train and reverse process where the truly liberated Southern Africa 
would assist in liberating the rest of Africa from neocolonialism and the clutches of imperialism. So sidebar, they knew, so Henry Kissinger knew with these two movements being successful, these two revolutionary gunfight movements in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique, and Angola, you know what I'm saying, what would be repeated in Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa, it was set in train a reverse process where the truly liberated Southern Africa would assist in liberating rest of Africa from neocolonialism and the clutches of imperialism. Thirdly, Although the entry of South Africa and Angola inferior in many African states, the system manifesto had encouraged such behavior by rendering South Africa recognized as an independent state and thereby rumored from the line of their freedom fire. The quarrel with South Africa was reduced to disapproval of its domestic policy of apartheid. Mm. So they broke it down to that. Mm. The methods to be used all fall short of one that counts. The armed struggle. Even the Dr. Salam Declaration of 1974, the armed struggle is reserved for Zimbabwe and Namibia. When it comes to South Africa, the Declaration states, Africa responsibility is clear. We must ostracize and urge the rest of the world to ostracize South African regime at the present organized. Africa must maintain economic, political, and cultural boycott of South Africa. The OAU and the UN must work in concert for the extension of the boycott. Page 21 in the manifesto. Support for liberation movements of, Southern Af of South Africa is mentioned in passing after the boycott strategies have been elaborated upon. Although it's known that these boycotts have never really been effective in dealing with the network of imperialism, of international capitalism and global multilateral imperialism. What is needed is not the recognition of an independent South Africa, but rather a recognition that South Africa is the hub of imperialism and militarism in Southern Africa. Therefore, no meaningful independence could be had in that region without its cooperation and approval. The strongest factor that has initiated from military from against the adoption of an aggressive policy towards South Africa is the myth of its military might and economic strength. These myths have been spread up by imperialist propaganda and the analysis of bourgeoisie scholars who recorded military strengths in the term of inventorial weapons without taking into account the will of the people. South Africa's economy had a balance of payment crisis since 1966. Her imports from Europe continue to run far ahead of its exports, hence the desire to sell its manufactured goods to undeveloped African states. On the military side, the explosion of resistance from students in Soweto near Johannesburg and Glatano near Cape Town and other cities in South Africa in June 1976 has shown the strength of unarmed masses who had the political will and the weakness of a well-armed South African defense force. For several months, the South African police and army have failed to suppress unarmed students in the youth of Soweto. The success of the MPLA in Angola and a successful explosion of South African troops exploded the myth of invincibility spread so effectively and widely by the imperialist propaganda. More importantly, MMP success has shown the truth and correctness of the analysis of the revolutionary strategies on Southern Africa. Namely, the main engines of resistance will, and it should be the workers and the students. The African dependency has declined sharply and been rendered impotent by the harsh and rigid systems of control, especially the notorious past system who prevent or reduce interaction between village and city. An organization with a viable leadership and a strong ideology can tap a lot of strength and support for the South African workers and students. The strength of the MPLA was neither in numbers nor in weaponry, but in the quality and character of its organization. Let me read this again. The strength of the MPLA was neither in numbers nor weaponry, but the quality of the character in its organization. UNITA had a large number of supporters among the largest tribe in Angola. And the FLNA had considerable firepower from Zaire and the US. And the MPLA, but the MPLA had organization deeply rooted among the workers in Luanda, the capital, along the line of the rail. And these workers organized themselves in units 
and even in factories and residential areas who reports a tax from the FLNA and Yanita and held the capital for many weeks before the Cuban and Russian help arrived. The intense mobilization of the workers and the clarity of the objectives being sought were the major factors that contributed to the strength and sources of the MPLA. It's being an organization, not money and weapons, that would decide the fate of Southern Africa. As indeed is the side of fate of Cam Vietnam and Cambodia. So it's like that's the end of it right there. You know what I'm saying? So they got the help from Cuba. Once the Cuban gave them the help, first of all, once um Angola was in the independent, the groups are already fighting for the so-called freedom groups are already fighting and stuff like that. But the Portuguese then wiped their hands clean of it. So while the group that was in control was getting attacked by these two other groups. One by um, one from the north, from Zaire, financed by the United States, you know, and the other one from the south, financed by the United States and South Africa. They went ahead and got help from the Cubans, and the Cubans came all through and helped them on out, and, uh, and the Russians. So, but when it came down to giving the OAU coming down to support, because they had Cuban and Russian help, the OAU turned their back with them because they was afraid that revolutions could pop off in their cities and their towns and their countries and stuff like that. So the OAU turned their back on that. You know what I'm saying? And that's what we got talked about again, like the conservative element in the group. You know, once you got this conservative element, you're going to have a group that's not thinking forward thinking it's going to be, the creativity is going to be crashed down, you know what I'm saying, and dampened down. You know what I'm saying? So you always got to have a creative element, a liberal-minded speaking element within the group on the forefront. And because they didn't have it, the OAU became what it became, you know, just a group with all big talk and no, no action. So they left the MPLA, the, the group that was getting attacked on both sides, hanging by themselves. So they went outside their network, not really outside, they were still in the network and talked to other countries that brought the Cubans and Russians in. And then the Cubans and Russians started winning. So Henry Kissinger had to come in and, and pipe it down, you know. And he got most of the OAU to, to back him because number one, he had brought most of them off with the American aid. And number two, he also was scared of them and saying that this can happen too in your country. You know what I'm saying? Remember, since we buy y'all off with aid, we and y'all letting the status quo go on by, this can happen too in your country. So they hear it getting kind of nixed it on off. But you know, as I said before, you know. The major factor that's contributed to the strength and success of the MPLA is its man and organization. It's the quality of people and the organization. You understand that you get in your group. You know, that's what's gonna make this stuff happen. The quality of people that you get and how we'll organize, not the money, not the weapons, you know, because they can't move with that. Once they said they can't move with the money and the weapons, it, it's gonna be hard for them. It's very hard for them to feed you. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. You know, I kind of enjoyed it myself. Much love to you and yours. You know, subscribe to the channel. You know, you click it up, you know what I'm saying? Show some love because we spend this African history every day, all day. Peace.